Brickyard 4467, wind 200 at 10, zero, zero, runway 31 left at Kilo Echo, clear for takeoff. <laughs> The United States was not a major player in the transoceanic shipping industry during most of the ocean liner era. The transatlantic routes in particular were dominated by Britain, Germany, and France. To make matters worse for the United States, the passage of Prohibition made it illegal for American registered ships to serve alcohol and, as a result, passengers, including Americans, chose to avoid ships flying the American flag. The United States Lines was among the few American shipping lines, and it consolidated the American market even further by absorbing the American Line in 1932, the Baltimore Mail Line in 1937, and the American Merchant Line in 1938. Even the United States Lines, though, did not have an extensive portfolio of great liners. Around this time, the only super liner the United States could claim was the 60,000-ton SS Leviathan, which was the German-built ship and formerly German-owned SS Vaterland. By the 1930s, the United States lines began to turn things around for the U.S. In 1932, the SS Manhattan was delivered to the United States lines. Manhattan and her sister Washington were the first ships built for the United States lines. These sister ships were financially successful, and the United States lines wanted to build another ship. Instead of ordering another sister to the Manhattan and the Washington, the United States lines hired naval architect William Francis Gibbs to design something new with the hopes that it would become America's answer to France's SS Normandy and Britain's RMS Queen Mary. The project even received financial support from the U.S. government as part of the New Deal. The ship that became the SS America entered service in 1940, but because of World War II, she started her career transporting passengers between New York and the west coast of the United States via the Panama Canal instead of serving on the transatlantic route. The United States had its flagship, and the SS America was in fact the largest passenger ship constructed in the United States. At 26,000 tons though, the SS America was still not a large ship compared to other major ocean liners. On top of that, the SS America was considerably slower than the other flagships of the world with a maximum speed of approximately 23 knots. To put that into perspective, the Queen Mary was over 80,000 tons and boasted a top speed of approximately 32 knots. Normandy had remarkably similar characteristics to Queen Mary. At the end of World War II, the SS America finally started servicing the transatlantic route, but was without a proper running mate. So in 1948, the United States Lines was already looking to build the next flagship for the country. This time, it would be a true superliner to challenge those of other nations, particularly Britain and France. After the proven success of Cunard's Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth as troop ships during the war, the U.S. government began to appreciate the value of having a large, fast civilian liner at its disposal to mobilize troops quickly. Like the America, the construction of the United States Line's new ship would be subsidized by the U.S. government, and William Francis Gibbs would be the designer. The public funding, though, came with some conditions. The ship had to be capable of rapid conversion into a troop ship, and the theoretical conversion would have to be possible within a 48-hour window. In the troop ship configuration, the ship was required to have a capacity of at least 14,000 troops. The ship also had to have a more robust watertight compartment system, which would allow the ship to survive more severe incidents. It would also have to have dual engine compartments so that a breach of one compartment would not fully cripple the ship. In practice, the ship would be capable of cruising at 23 knots with one of the two engine rooms out of commission. The ship would also need to be fast. The exact speed requirements weren't clear, but luckily the United States Lines was in agreement and they too wanted to build the fastest ocean liner in the world. Many design choices were made for the sake of speed, but the two most important were the all-aluminum superstructure and the 250,000 horsepower turbines installed on the ship, 50% more than Queen Mary and by far the most ever installed on an ocean liner. Finally, the ship would also need to be more fire resistant than a typical ocean liner. Gibbs took this requirement to the extreme. Flammable materials were all but excluded from the ship. Gibbs liked to proclaim that there were ultimately only two types of wooden objects on board, grand pianos, and the butcher blocks. In reality, there was wood in the bilge keel and lining the propeller bosses as well. Vast amounts of asbestos were installed on the ship to make it even more fire resistant. The design of the interiors of the ship avoids large sweeping rooms which, as seen in the case of the SS Normandy, contribute to the rapid spread of fire at sea. Of course, there was one more condition. The ship could be requisitioned by the US Navy in the event of a war. 
As was the case with the SS America, the responsibility of designing the ship's interiors fell to Dorothy Markwald, who was a partner of the New York design firm Smythe, Urquhart, and Markwald. The firm, and particularly Dorothy, had been working with Gibbs and Cox for many years. The idea being, since women typically were the ones to make travel arrangements, the ship should appeal to women in order to sell tickets. Despite the interiors being designed by the same firm as those of the America, those of the big ship, as the ship was called during the design phase, was of an entirely different style. SS America had been fitted with beautiful and rich Art Deco interiors. The ship that would become the SS United States, though, went for a sleeker style. At the time, the modern interiors were popular, and the minimalist decor helped with the requirement of a 48-hour conversion to a troop ship. The color palette for the ship was vibrant, with reds, blues, greens, and golds being dominant. Public rooms were decorated patriotically, but not lavishly. Fire safety continued to be emphasized in the fitting out phase. To ensure the furnishings did not compromise the safety of the ship, Gibbs had a mock-up cabin constructed. If you've learned anything about William Francis Gibbs so far, you can see where this is going. Foreign objects representing passenger belongings were set afire in the mock-up. These objects all burned, but the fire did not spread to any of the room's furnishings or structure. At some point during the fitting out phase, the soon-to-be captain of the ship was presented with a beautiful reclining chair for his cabin. Unfortunately for the captain, though, the chair was made of mahogany, and Gibbs had it removed from the ship. Before the ship was even delivered to the United States lines, America's soon-to-be flagship was highly publicized and promoted. The American people, who paid for a substantial portion of the design and construction costs, had high expectations. Despite the anticipation, everything below the waterline was concealed from the public on launch day. Had it been visible, the onlookers would have seen a smooth hull nearly absent of rivets. Since she was built in a dry dock, the valves were simply opened to let the water from the James River in, which eventually lifted the SS United States from the keel blocks upon which she was constructed. Her being built in a dry dock also meant that she was two-thirds complete by the time she was in the water. Engines, boilers, and funnels were already installed, which meant that she could begin her sea trials even sooner. And in June 1952, the United States set out for the official trials. The results were kept secret, but we know some of the details today. It was later revealed that the ship achieved speeds of at least 38 knots, the term at least being key. At the risk of downplaying the remarkable power of the ship, it needs to be stated that there is speculation that the ship could reach much higher speeds ranging from 42 knots to 50 knots. But even the lowest end of this range made her by far the fastest ocean liner in the world, surpassing Queen Mary by 6 knots. At the end of June 1952, the public was finally allowed to see its ship. 70,000 people lined up to see the completed United States and have a chance to step aboard before anyone else. But the United States would have to prove it. On July 3, 1952, the SS United States ushered in Independence Day celebrations when she departed New York on her maiden voyage. Commodore Harry Manning, commander of the United States, had cautiously managed expectations. It was common for a new, promising ship to wait for a few voyages before making a run for the transatlantic speed record. But the United States couldn't help herself. While Americans at home were celebrating the 4th of July, their flagship was speeding across the Atlantic towards Europe. During the voyage, the blue ribbon holder, the Queen Mary, passed the United States as her passengers gathered on deck to get a view of the newest ship of state. Three and a half days later, on the morning of July 7th, the United States sounded her horns to announce her arrival and the shattering of the eastbound transatlantic speed record. The United States had crossed 10 hours faster than Cunard's Queen Mary had ever been able to. There was no doubt that America was about to take the Blue Ribbon for the first time since 1854, and on July 15, 1952, the United States arrived back in New York after a 3-day, 12-hour, and 12-minute crossing. The United States had captured the Blue Ribbon. America had the fastest ocean liner in the world, with competition nowhere in sight. For the first time, America had a spot on the world stage of shipbuilding. The maiden voyage proved something else to the public too, that the ship did not suffer from vibration, even at her highest speeds. Hull vibration was dreaded by shipbuilders and owners because it was difficult to predict during design and construction, but could dampen passenger enthusiasm once a ship was in service. Post-construction solutions to hull vibration were expensive, if not impossible. All who sailed in the United States quickly knew that she was both fast and sturdy. With the short-lived career of the airship in the past, ships were still the only way to cross oceans, and overnight, the United States became the ship to sail on. She carried many VIPs during her career, including Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy, Dwight Eisenhower, Marilyn Monroe, Walter Cronkite, Bob Hope, and even members of the British royalty, arguably betraying the beloved Queen Mary. As for William Francis Gibbs, he finally had his dream ship, 
and he telephoned the ship every day she was at sea to get performance data. But in reality, he wanted to check in with the ship. In addition to being a national spectacle, the SS United States was a financial success for her owners. Due to her reserve power, meaning that the ship could always go faster than her service speed in order to make up for lost time, the United States was not late a single time. From an operational standpoint, the United States lines did have a little trouble planning voyages, since the United States was so much faster than her running mate, the SS America. But the company was able to make it work. And even after the dawn of the jet age, the United States remained viable. While most ships were running closer and closer to empty, the United States lines was able to fill their flagship during the peak summer season. Eventually though, even the United States succumbed to aviation. Most of the world's ocean liners were already gone, and while some, like the SS France and the RMS Queen Elizabeth II, were being introduced, they were designed with looming change in mind, and these ships spent much of their time cruising. The SS United States, though, was built to be the ultimate ocean liner, and she was not up to the task of cruising. She was unexpectedly pulled from service in November 1969. The future of the SS United States was uncertain, but the ship wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. Because the details of the ship's construction and technology were classified Navy secrets, the United States lines could not sell her. Finally though, in 1978, the US Navy relinquished the SS United States, allowing her to be sold. This started a 30 year period during which the ship was passed from owner to owner. One of these owners was Norwegian Cruise Line, who purchased the ship in 2003 with the hopes of bringing her back to service as a converted cruise ship. Had Norwegian's goal come to fruition, the United States would have been sailing alongside another former ocean liner, the SS Norway, which had joined the Norwegian fleet in 1980. Norwegian's plans for the SS United States struggled though, and the economic crisis of 2009 forced the company to begin seeking buyers for the ship. Many of the offers made to Norwegian were from scrapyards, but at the last moment, the nonprofit SS United States Conservancy received funds from a Philadelphia philanthropist for the purpose of buying the ship from Norwegian. To Norwegian's credit, the company agreed to sell the ship to the SS United States Conservancy for less than it could have received from a scrapyard. Since 2010, the SS United States and those who cherish her have experienced a roller coaster of hope and disappointment. Many proposals to make the ship a sustainable living testament to the ocean liner era have come and gone, but none have materialized. As of February 2020, the most promising possibility to save the ship is a proposal to move the ship to New York, her former home port, where she could be used as a museum ship and a real estate development. The SS United States would be a fitting addition to the intrepid sea, air, and space museum, which boasts the Space Shuttle Enterprise, former British Airways Concorde, the American naval submarine Growler, and, of course, the USS Intrepid aircraft carrier. Even though it may not be practical to bring the SS United States back to a seaworthy state, her empty interiors make for a flexible platform for usable space, and it is said that her structure is sound, more so even than the Queen Mary, which lives on as a hotel and museum in Long Beach, California. The SS United States Conservancy is working relentlessly to save the great symbol of national pride and a stunning example of the bygone ocean liner era. The Great Big Move has made a donation to the Conservancy, and I encourage subscribers to the Great Big Move to make a donation as well by going to ssusc.org.